the next item on the agenda is the, is the uh, status report on return to in-person learning. Dr. Bolson. Good evening, everybody. So uh, everyone heard the message earlier today. I will briefly review what was in that message and uh, provide a little bit more detail. But then I really want to be able to open up to questions from the board. Uh, I will share with you one visual to start, and it's something that you probably will have seen. For those who are listening, I am sharing from the MarylandPublicSchools.org website the um, COVID-19 guidance for MD schools, it's page two. Okay, and so board, you should be able to see that for anyone following along on the audio. You can you can find the MarylandPublicSchools.org website, and if you look down kind of the middle of the page, there's a link to the, the guidance document there. That's how I get to it anyway. Um, this is decision making metrics uh, from the state of Maryland. The, the guidance for schools is very much based on community transmission and community level metrics. Of course, we consider the impact on the schools. We consider a number of different things when making decisions. But uh, through our plan, through our dis discussions this year, we have talked about um, essentially two major metrics and then some others that you know contribute to the information. Um, as expected, we have people you know with concerns kind of on both sides. Uh, we heard a little bit tonight about people who'd like to see us closing down quicker. And I know we have folks who would like to have us opening quicker. Um, page two of the guidance that I'm sharing and the decision making metrics for <coughs> communities with a positivity rate above 5%. Um, they should then look at the new case rate, which is, and there's a range there of cases between five per 100,000 and 15 per 100,000. And we are above 15 per 100,000. And with that guidance, the suggestion is limited or no in-person programs. In Harford County, as of today, the rolling seven day average for new cases per 100,000 is 19.57. Uh, it has a, been above the 15 cases mark for three days and it has been increasing um, for about a week and a half. And it's been on a pretty steep trajectory. Uh, we don't know when it will be turning around. Um, and then our positivity rate as of today was 6 point, I believe 3%. Uh, that case has been above the cutoff of 5% now for five days, and it's also continuing on an upward trajectory. With that said, um, we've had multiple conversations with our colleagues at the health department, and let me see the names here. I know um, our interim health officer, uh, Marcy Austin is with us on the call this evening, and I'm going to ask her to to comment here in just a little bit, as well as Linda Bogner, who also is from the health department, and has and both of them have been engaged regularly with us in our team meetings relating to our return to in-person metrics and our planning, uh, as well as many informal conversations about where we stand. Um, we also have others from our staff who you've heard from before. Probably the two who you hear from most on this topic are Mary Nasuda and, and then Katie Ridgway, names that should be familiar to everyone. And, and then I also would ask Dr. Phillips and Dr. Bauer to chime in at some point here as they've been party to all these conversations as well. So with our rates the way they are, uh, the guidance from the state reads limited or no in-person programs. Uh, I would also refer you to our 
continuity of learning plan. And again, we we will adjust this. There's still comments in there's there's information in the continuity of learning plan that suggests where we are today. And of course, those slides will will need to be adjusted because our metrics have changed. Um, but very simply, slide 28 or page 28 of the plan, uh, which you can find on our website basically points to where we are in high transmission high transmission being of course a time where positivity is greater than five percent new cases are greater than 15 per 100,000 and again we suggest no in-person activities and so that's been in our plan um one adjustment i would like to say that uh, again as the state guidance says limited or no in-person programs The probably the group of students who we are most concerned with being able to deliver virtual instruction are those, and we know there are many in the county who do not have adequate access to the internet. Our schools have been keeping track of that. Many of those students who need internet have been enrolled in our uh, learning support center model. Of course, those have all transitioned to the teachers, uh, but we still refer to them as the, the students from the learning centers. And those are the students who in five days a week so they could access the internet. Um, we will be working on, again, using the data we already have related to knowing which students do not have internet, working on finding temporary solutions for them to have internet. In some cases, we have hotspots, um, but we know we may also need to create some connectivity spaces. Um, other school districts have used this model just for the sake of internet that's the one thing that i feel we rely on so much to ensure our students have access to our digital learning so we don't have to resort to providing pencil and paper you know learning resources as we did in the spring so we will be reaching out to families to to um, access some sort of connectivity hubs or places where people who need to get internet can be um, and more information about that will be coming this week. That's one of the reasons we needed a couple days to actually move into our close down phase. Um, as we return to all virtual learning, as we said, we will be closed as of Friday. Friday is normally our asynchronous day. Um, and so that will be the first day that our students are essentially sent home. Um, that provides us the next three days to ensure we close down we get students the things they need uh, in hand to take with them i know a lot of schools have already been planning because they've seen the metrics and so they've been sending things home with students we want to make sure they have the recess resources necessary to um, be able to successfully navigate the virtual learning i guess i before i ask others to to contribute their thoughts i would like to say um, reiterate what we've heard from some of our board members this evening we want our students in school there is no question around that um, this has been a very hard decision um, the goal in returning will be to return uh, as quickly as the metrics allow uh, what we put in the message this evening and what we hope to work toward is if we see the metrics both rates if we drop below the 5% positivity and we drop below 15 uh, cases per 100,000, if we are there for a week, then we will start the clock to bring our students back. Uh, the goal will be to have them back if possible within one week after we've had a week of positive experience, meaning a total of two weeks out, if the data, you know, once the data turns around. And coming back, Currently, it is our hope that we would bring students back to where we are today, meaning as of today, we have our hybrid in place in pre-K through five with our um, special needs programs, our CTE, our ELL, our learning support center students, those five day a week students at all levels, um, that we would go back to the status where we are today and we would open up you know, whatever day we kind of indicate once we follow that two week process. Um, one question that we need to answer is how quickly behind that we would follow with the secondary hybrid. And that's something we can discuss 
and, and it's something that we will work with our, our planning groups to, to see. Um, one of the things we know about the transmission among students, among uh, student people of younger ages, so zero to nine, we have a very low transmission rate. 10 to 19, we have almost 10 times, no, scratch that, um, about five times the number of um, transmission at the older grades. So we see a much higher rate in students 10 to 19. Um, that's maybe something that our health department colleagues could, could comment on. But also knowing that much of our disruption has been to losing staff members who've been caught up in quarantine and isolation circumstances or those who have tested positive both uh, we've had a number of cases inside the workplace, but we've also uh, we've had a number of cases that we identified at the workplace, but we've also had um, many people who've been identified as COVID positive uh, outside of work, but then they were thus not available to, to work. And so keeping the building staff has been challenging, particularly as the rates have been increasing. So I will stop my comments there. I know there will be plenty of questions. Uh, so I'd like to ask um, first, um, either Ms. Nasuda or Ms. Ridgeway, if they would like to just add to my comments to, 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 in the, in the, uh, to, if anything needs to be strengthened or clarified, um, if you would jump in and then if we could turn it over briefly to our colleagues from the health department and then I'll move to the board members after that. This is Mary Nasuda, the Supervisor of Health Services. It's not much. Katie and I are always talking, so it's weird when neither of us answered right away. Um, uh, we have been watching these numbers very closely. It's something that we do each morning. We look at the numbers. We work with the health department, and we are so fortunate to have such amazingly um, uh, gifted and very um, responsive uh, partnerships with the health department. They have been wonderful in responding to all of us as we need to. I do want to say thank you so much to our school nurses who have been working so hard to make so many of these phone calls and so many hard choices as we do our isolation and quarantine based on our Maryland Department of Health decision aid. Um, they have done a really stellar job of really keeping track, making sure our data is clean. And I just want to say thank you so much to them. And um, I just want to really reassure everyone of that partnership that we're using to the fullest extent um, and talking to these partners every day, multiple times a day. And I think this is Katie Ridgeway. I think the main things I would like to add is to reiter reiterate that our mission is to have students in school and it is to um, give as many opportunities as possible during this pandemic but we have to do it in a way that um, is leading in our responsibilities and leading in what our mission is that also includes safety and health and so those two things seem to be sometimes a conflict right now and it is something that is a part of every single decision that we make and is something that we don't take lightly. All right, um, Ms. Austin, would you like to jump in? Sure, sure. I'm in uh, total agreement that, you know, we all want to work towards getting children back in school. I think that um, we exceeded our numbers in those metrics, the 5% positivity and the 15 per 100,000 on Saturday. Um, we've been in constant contact with, with the school system, um, you know, and, and seen the rise even more quickly. Um, we're seeing a lot, lot more cases um, in children now. So, um, you know, we're seeing some, some cases in the zero to nine age group. In fact, over the last two weeks, we've seen a 38% increase in those numbers. Um, and the 10 to 19 age group, we've seen an 18% increase. So we're concerned, you know, about the children. Um, and um, so I would just um, reiterate that, that I'm in full agreement with, with the plan to keep children safe. Ms. Fogner, did you want to add anything? 
Hi, everyone. I just wanted to kind of go back to Dr. Bauer's comment about the the community issues that we're having too, because the we haven't had too many cases of uh, children, you know, transmitting one to the other in the schools. We haven't really seen that, and we haven't seen staggering, you know, extraordinary staggering numbers in the schools. But the the community spread right now is really driving our decision, and we're hoping maybe people can get back on track, really focus on the social distancing, wear your mask, you know. Um, practice all those mitigation strategies to hopefully hopefully get us back on track and get these schools open. Thank you. Um, and I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Bauer or Dr. Phillips. This is David. Um, I'm reminded of a quote which I unfortunately don't have in front of me from a article uh, this summer that basically said, if we all agree that our highest priority is getting children back into schools in the fall, then we should not be opening up now. We need to be basically staying home, social distancing, wearing masks, taking things as seriously as possible. Um, that didn't happen. And here we are closing down the schools again. Um, I'm sorry for the disruptions it causes to everyone. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of work from whether it's students, parents, teachers, uh, the support staff, the administration on getting this to work. And we're all going to keep working on getting it to work even when we switch back to virtual. Um, I was trying to think about where I wanted to start. Um, and I was thinking that, you know, this is our worst nightmare or worst case scenario, but it really isn't. Um, our worst case scenario is to see a bad outcome in a child or a teacher or a staff member. So we haven't gotten to that point, thankfully, um, and hopefully we never will. But uh, when we were setting up, when we set up this task force a few months ago, um, planning on coming back to school and talking about the what ifs, about whether we'd have to turn it around, I guess we all, we all had in the back of our minds that it was going to be a possibility, but I guess we were more hoping than realistic that it wouldn't occur, but um, it did. And um, as I mentioned earlier, I think we need to keep the safety of, of, of each and every person that walks into a school building in mind when we make these decisions. Um, but these decisions are not made uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a vacuum. Um, we're using state guidance, we're using CDC guidance, and we're using the guidance of our own health department, who has been extraordinarily helpful to us. Um, I, I said to Dr. Bolson earlier, um, when, uh, when the announcement was finally made at a meeting we had this afternoon, that I just had this horrible, sick feeling in my stomach. And um, his response to me was, uh, thank you, I feel the same way. So we all, we all feel horrible that we have to take this... Uh, this approach, but the, the numbers are just staggering. And I just beg the community to um, maybe take a little extra precaution of uh, what they're doing. I passed a number of fields during this weekend and saw a bunch of kids out there playing and they were keeping their distance, but on the sidelines there were uh, parents and who, know, who knows who, el who else might have been out there. Um, I would say less than half of them were, were wearing masks, if, if that many. Um, so you be, be smart and let's see if we can um, turn this around quickly, because I know um, Dr. Bolson and the staff are committed to turning this around quickly as far as getting kids back if the, uh, if the numbers show a quick turnaround. And we're all hoping for that. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Robinson, if you would like to turn it over for, for board questions, 
Uh, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, we've heard from Dr. Ha uh, Bauer, so let's move to Ms. Carwacki. Okay, you can hear me now. We got you now. <laughs> Thank you. I um, kept getting kicked off by the router, so I, I think that um, given the information that we have, from the health department, from our own health resources within the school system, and CDC advice that we have no choice at this point other than to close the schools temporarily. It's in the best interest of our students and our staff members to take this step, and I sincerely hope that um, all of our community members can be really realistic about this and know that we want nothing more than to have our children back in the classroom safely and permanently. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Mueller. No, I, I just want to thank you for making this difficult decision. Um, I, I know there's a whole group of parents out there that want us to go to school without any restriction, and there's another group that doesn't want us to go back no matter what. We're not going to make everybody happy. So um, I'm glad that you're working in concert with the health department in the best interest of our students. Thank you. Ms. Riccardi. Um, just want to really reiterate what Ms. Karwaki just said, um, people are not going to be happy with this decision, but we are required to make this decision based on the guidelines we've been given um, from the state superintendent um, and Gov Governor Hogan will be speaking tomorrow at five o'clock and it will be interesting to see if there are any further impacts that he will be presenting tomorrow at five. So I encourage everybody to listen in. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Rush. Um, can we, can you talk about the timeline for reopen? Assuming we get past this, right? We're gonna, we'll start on the downward trend again. Where, where, what are the metrics and, and how long will it take? I think that's one of the, the comments that I heard this evening is the, the you know, trying to, the consistency, I guess. Well, then, uh, I think the consistency is probably the hardest thing to achieve right now. We certainly heard that in the comments. I think, you know, our goal is to get students in as quickly as we can based on the metrics. And so, and we know that, you know, we're at the mercy of the peaks and valleys. The only way to ensure consistency would be to leave students out entirely. And I, I don't think that's a, or I wouldn't support that plan. I think when we can get students in, we need to get them in. Um, so again, what, what we've suggested, uh, what I am proposing is a, when we see five days of those two rates below their target numbers, so, um, below 15 cases per hundred thousand for five days and below 5% for five days. Um, on that point, at that point, we begin the planning. Uh, like I said, I hope we can return to a class within one week after that. So basically from the time we start seeing the data drop below those numbers, if it stays there for two weeks, we should be back in school two weeks later. So a total of two weeks later. Um, again, it's hard because we don't know if we're going to see numbers going up and down and how long we, you know, we need to look at that. And again, these are all conversations. So I say that with as much certainty as we can. You know, I think there's always room for gray area. If it, if we see it drop below and then one day it hits 5.03%, that was one of the numbers we saw, I think, earlier this week. You know, but it does that for one day that drops down below. Again, there will be conversations we have with the health department. So it's not 100%, but we're, we're um, but again, we watch the, we watch the trajectories what we're seeing right now with both numbers going in the same direction and not changing and not changing direction. 
So the short answer to your question is it could be as quick as two weeks once the numbers start to turn around, um, but it could be longer if they don't. Understood. And of course, the, I know everybody's a lot of concern is around the learning support centers and also our kids with special needs. So goes without saying. Anyway, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Ms. Bailey. Um, no, I didn't have any questions. I just wanted to thank Dr. Wilson, like everyone else, for the presentation. And Ms. Rush basically answered the question that I had, and that's all. Ms. Godier. Yeah, thank you. I do have a few questions um, that I know parents are going to be asking about, and I understand that there might not be answers because this is a decision, you know, that's less than 12 hours old. Um, but where is this going to put us? And it seems a little petty. I get it. Um, but I'm going to ask it because I know it's a question everybody's going to have. Where does this put us in terms of sports and conditioning? I'm presuming that it means that we are off the grid again and that conditioning cannot take place. Would that be correct? That is, yes. Let me, let me just leave it as a very short answer. That is correct. Okay, sort of what I thought. We're continuing with the planning uh, because we, we were in the process of rolling out the December 7th plan. I think we'll be watching other districts. We haven't, uh, I think one has produced a plan for December 7th, which was part of the, the state board information. Um, so we're continuing to plan toward the possibility of joining that season. I don't know where the district's going to be. We see many other districts in the state have very high numbers. But as of today, yes, we are pushing back the um, the plans for in-person athletics as well. Okay. Um, in terms of the connectivity hubs that, that we're talking about, um, I'm presuming that one of the questions that everybody's asking is obviously this includes learning center kids. The schools will be closed. We are 100% virtual, including the learning center kids, correct? Yes, the only exception would be in those places where we contact people to come in for the the internet. So that will be a much more scaled down version uh, that is significantly fewer than we had in learning centers. Okay, and in terms of those connectivity hubs, obviously we're not going to open every single school. We'll have, you know, we have our list. We know who it is that is not connected, and we will invite them to schools close to them in probably a cafeteria setting, but there will not be people there to help them. There will be supervisors to make sure that, you know, they're not leaving things all over the place and they're wearing masks. Is that pretty accurate? It would look much more like the learning centers did on when we first opened. So yes, it is. It's proctors. It's specifically because we know some people can't get access to internet. Um, and so it'll look much more like the learning centers did right at the beginning of the year with just the with the proctors. Okay. Um, will teachers who want to teach in their rooms be allowed to go into their rooms and teach? Yes. Excellent. Um, are we talking about keeping front offices open in the schools or do we not know what that's going to look like yet? Uh, I don't have a full answer for that. Again, we're trying to minimize the total number of people who are, you know, coming in in person. We want to be able to do the best we can to offer the service from those areas, but at the same time, we're trying to strike a balance with the number of people who are needing to report in person because then that starts to create other issues like the need for daycare for those staff and things like that. So these are all things that we're consider continuing to consider. Um, but the, the first step we know for the in-person is the connectivity spots. Okay, and this is going to seem strange, but I promise I'm going somewhere with it. Um, do we know how many teachers have taken leave or have retired since we came back in person? I don't know that I could give you a total to that. Um, we... Uh, Ms. Ridgeway might be able to jump in or Ms. Montagna might be able to jump in, but again, it would only be general numbers. Um, and then the leave issue is we've had considerable issues with um, 
leave for short terms if, as people have been um, quarantined, isolated, stuff like that. So we've, we've had a lot of work keeping the staff, you know, having enough staff as people have been pulled out for reasons like that. Um, but the overall departures from the profession, I don't know what the total number is. Uh, Ms. Montaigne has her hand up. You want to respond to that? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, I, this is this data is of over a week, about a week old. So I'm, I'm estimating a little bit higher. I'm at the point in time of this data, we had 119 individuals out on FMLA leave. I'm anticipating that 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 as that continued to grow this past week. So I'm estimating we may be around 150 possibly even to 175 on FMLA, um, about 50 on uh, EDA leave. I don't have the retirement uh, at my fingertips here, but I can send that to you. The number of retirements since July 1st, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you very much, Jean. My, my purpose in asking that question, um, and I don't know if it's a possibility, but if any of them said that they we're leaving, retiring, going on leave due to not not being able to feel safe teaching in person. Is it possible that they could come back and teach us subs? Because I know again that we're we're struggling to fill fill those positions mid year. Um, well, yes, we are looking at a plan. We're working, beginning to develop a plan at this time. Uh, those that are out on family medical leave or through the um, FFCRA leave because of the um, COVID issue and not wanting to teach in person, they, in essence, would not no longer have a reason for that leave. So we are working on a process to make some contact, make some decisions about returning those individuals back to work, which at this time would be virtually from home. Okay, great. Um, and one of my other questions, who are we looking at to proctor in those um, connectivity hubs, Dr. Bolson? Is that, has that been made clear yet? It's not our teachers or who, who would it be? The so when we began staffing the learning centers, um, we we did a number of things. We reassigned many people from other positions. We had bus drivers, we had uh, food nutrition workers, we had paraeducators, we had many people assigned to those, but we also hired new staff. Um, so people who were hired specifically to augment the staff in the learning centers because we needed so many people to supervise those the way we designed them. We still have uh, many of those people employed for the last few weeks since we started the hybrid, we had the teachers back. Uh, they have been assigned to the elementary schools to help with daily coverage uh, and to support in classrooms. So in, in many cases, again, we've indicated we've had a, a lot of circumstances where individuals were out and so they've become the sub in the classroom for that. Or in other cases, if they didn't need that many subs at school, we had a couple people assigned, we could use them to help out, particularly in the younger grades to just provide support to the students, um, support the teacher. So we still have, um, I believe, adequate numbers of learning support center staff, people who are hired specifically for that role. So they would be the primary proctors. And then beyond that, the staffing in um, the connectivity hub would, we would need an administrator in the building. We would need a counselor. We would need a nurse. We would probably need some clerical support in the building. So a, a fairly minimal supervisory staff uh, in each of the places that we open. So we're looking at how many of those uh, spots we will need, and that will help us determine how many people will be working there. Dr. Bolson, may I add a, a bit of additional information? Of course. Uh, so uh, what I will what I will also like to share, uh, Rachel, is that. The number I received today was about 80 individuals that we hired from the outside to be in our learning support centers that have been deployed since the time of the learning support centers, as Dr. Bolson had indicated. So that would be our initial group that we would be looking to um, to transition into these hubs. Again, we this is very early. We are working on, we're talking about a plan, a process for making that happen. Um, the other thing that I did want to share, one of my staff members who has been listening to this board meeting from home uh, sent me the information about retirements. 
So she indicated, thank you, Liz Miller, that we've received 22 retirement notices um, of staff um, that would be retiring as of January 1, uh, 2021. We cannot obviously say that those are all as a result of COVID conditions, but um, that would be the number that we have. Okay, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to also just kind of question. I know that one of the things that changed, and it kind of doesn't have anything to do with this, but it kind of does, that changed today was the announcement that food will be handed out differently um, starting on Friday. That uh, we will have, we will be giving out food at different locations. Well, not different locations, fewer locations and that it will be for five days a week. Is there any possibility in light of the fact that, you know, schools are schools are closing down, um, is there any possibility that we could perhaps utilize bus drivers and some of our um, cafeteria staff to go around to some of the further out or harder to reach um, kids and bus stops? I'm just concerned that there's a lot of parents that are still going to be working that won't be able to take advantage of that. And I know there are a lot of families that need it still. Hi, this is Deborah Judd. Um, we, that plan uh, really came together last week uh, for Friday. And obviously we have more discussion to um, partake in uh, with the changes today. The plan is to continue distributing on Fridays um, for the five meals and Kathy Bendis and transportation has already offered, um, you know, the services of the buses if possible. So we'll certainly look at that um, and see what makes the most sense um, and can reach the most children. Uh, obviously, we, we know we need to be able to reach them. We're, we're hopeful that the bulk of the students who were going to need access to food would be able to do this with the reduced um, sites, um, but we certainly need to, to look at that again. I just need to say publicly that I love Miss Judd and Miss Bendis. They are always thinking ahead of me and always know that I'm going to ask questions like that because I want to make sure our kids are taken care of and they do too. And I just love that about them. Um, that is actually all my questions for right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Godier. <clears throat> well, and I have no questions or comments. But what I would can like. I ask, can I ask another question, please, Jansen? This is Patrice Riccardi. Sure. Yes. Yes. Um, the communication that went out today that talked about return to virtual learning. There's been a lot of uh, questions I've seen on social media, and I'm getting some calls that it's not clear that because we didn't specifically mention the learning centers that the learning centers are part of that return to virtual learning. Um, it seems like it goes without saying, but my suggestion is maybe uh, some kind of post on the website or some additional clarification to parents so they'll understand that the learning centers are included in the return to virtual learning. Thank you. Thank you. So what I'd like to do is go back to um, Dr. Bauer and Dr. Phillips. Um, they were the two board members who served on the task force. And after hearing questions and comments um, during this session, if you have anything that you'd like to add or any comments you'd like to make. Start with Dr. Bauer. OK. Um, so I would like to ask the community to please think about what impact your actions may have. Um, both in terms of local gatherings and also travel to other places. Uh, right now, um, Harford especially, cases have been rising rapidly. Um, they're slightly higher than the overall Maryland average, but they're still lower than some of our neighboring counties like Baltimore County or Lancaster County um, or most of Delaware. And so I'm tired of this pandemic and quarantine, but unfortunately now's the time to get back to being serious for, uh, for those things that people have gotten lax on um, because we very much 
are seeing a rapid uh, growth in cases here in this county right now. Um, how long it stays with us, how long we have to stay entirely virtual depends on what happens in the community at large. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Um, yeah, I think it's pretty much, uh, David just uh, echoed what I was uh, thinking and um, our staff and everyone else who contributed this evening has pretty much uh, been right on, on par with uh, all the comments that I would have and I don't have any additional uh, statements to make. Um, just uh, let's, you know, let's practice uh, uh, appropriate uh, public health measures and um, see if we can turn this around, at least locally, relatively quickly. Thank you. Thank you.